Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to discuss community interactions that exist within the ecological world. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's remind ourselves what a community is. It's all the living species within a given area. All the reptiles and insects and plants would make up the community of this particular desert. All the life you could find in this African savanna makes up this community. All the invertebrates, all the fish, all the corals would make up the life in this community. So how does life interact with one another? Well, like these two rams butting heads with one another, they're probably competing for territory. Another form of interaction would be predator and prey. One organism simply eats another. And then the third type of community interaction would be the various kinds of symbiosis. So these are going to be the subjects of our video today. So let's go ahead and talk about competition. You know, in a community, there are factors that will limit the size of a population. We call these limiting factors. You know, examples would be like habitats. There's only so many places to live in a community. Another example of a limiting factor would be water. You know, there's only so many elephants that can survive off of the water in Africa. Another great example of a limiting factor is territory. You know, we have a couple male rams butting heads with one another to win territory. And in that territory are food and water and, and mates. So competition occurs whenever there is a challenge for these resources. Whenever the resources are limited, organisms within the community tend to compete with one another. You know, kind of another fun territorial example is the battle of territory between male elephant seals. You know, maybe the elephant seal here on the left is the current champion, the beach master. And the beach master owns all the resources on the beach that would include females to mate with. And every now and then, a young challenger will step up to the beach master and they will fight for the right to claim their territory. These are, you know, a great example here of of an example of competition for limited resources. You know, I briefly want to discuss a fairly famous experiment that was done on the topic of competition between microscopic organisms known as paramecia, which tend to live in freshwater ponds and rivers and lakes. And there's a few species of paramecia that were examined within this particular experiment. One of them is called P. aurelia. The P stands for paramecia. And this uh, paramecia was grown in a lab condition, in a lab setting, all by itself without any other species to compete with. And over the time, if we start plotting the population size, over the time, as the paramecia was given nutrients, it grew and multiplied. And as time went by, it grew and multiplied even further. And as more time passed, it multiplied. And again, it was given a, a steady amount of nutrition. And as you can see, eventually the population started to level off because, again, food, even though the paramecia was given food, food is a limiting factor, which led to the paramecia kind of hitting a plateau and leveling off. Well, look at the next part of this experiment. So in the next part of this experiment, a different species of paramecia called P. caudatum, P stands for paramecia, was grown again in a lab, similar settings where it was given food. And the, par the population started out very small, but over time, because it was given ample food, the paramecia multiplied. And as time went by, the paramecia multiplied even further. And as time went by, the paramecia even multiplied even further. And eventually, like we saw a moment ago with the other paramecia, there was a leveling off period where, you know, resources became a lim little limited. And so the population kind of flatlined and leveled off. Well, now look what happened in this experiment. So then in the experiment, the researcher grew both paramecia together and they fed off of the same nutrients. And what happened is a good example of why we're talking about this in our notes today. In red, the P. caudatum, and in blue, the P. aurelia, they, their population began very small. And then as time passed, as time passed, the, in red, the P. caudatum multiplied a little bit. And in blue, the P. aurelia multiplied a little bit as well. As more time passed, 
the P caudatum in red multiplied. As more time passed, the P aurelia in blue multiplied, but they multiplied at a little higher rate. Well, now look what happened. Over time, the P. aurelia was just more successful at capturing food, and so it was multiplying and outcompeting in red the P. caudatum. The P. caudatum actually started to die off because they just weren't able to feed as well and were being outcompeted for the limited nutrients that were provided to both of the paramecia when they were mixed together. And as time passed, in, in blue, the paramecia, cauda, paramecia aurelia continued to thrive. And eventually, they started to flatten off because, again, food was becoming re, uh, scarce for all. And as time went by, in red, the paramecia caudatum was really struggling to survive. They were just being outcompeted. And in blue, we see, again, the paramecia aurelia hits a flattening off period. And in red, the paramecia caudatum eventually died off. And so when we make our line graph, we can see that when they had to compete, one usually outcompeted the other. This led to what is known as the competitive exclusion principle. So the competitive exclusion principle says that no two species can occupy the same niche or the same role in the environment at the same time with another that also occupies the same niche. They will compete and that competition will usually exclude one and allow the other to continue to survive. Well, we see this in the world of business as well. Think about what happens, what tends to happen to the private locally owned hardware store when maybe a few blocks down the road, a hardware superstore opens nearby. Chances are the superstore can offer lower prices than the locally owned hardware store and it's probably going to sadly go out of business. You know, we see this in other areas of business as well. You know, major uh, coffee, uh, coffee chains have put a lot of small privately owned coffee businesses out of business. You know, also we see superstores like Walmart when they tend to move into an area small privately owned stores tend to go out of business because they can't compete with the lower prices. So we see this in nature and in economics as well. Okay, shifting back to community interactions, let's quickly discuss predation. You know, this is pretty straightforward, I think, when one organism captures and feeds on another organism. One organism is the predator, one organism is the prey or the victim. And so the predator would be the hunter, and the prey would be the hunted. And in this case, a fox uh, has killed uh, maybe a prairie dog. I can't really tell what that is in the picture, but that would be its prey. And we see this in you know, food chains. One organism will be eaten by the next organism up on the food chain, and that organism is eaten by the next organism up on the food chain. And, and we see how life interacts with, with the organism below it in the food chain. And as we remind ourselves within a community, food webs can be very complex because they tend to show all the feeding interactions between all the members within a community. So the feeding and the, the feeding relationships within a community can be quite complex. And these are often symbolized in what are called food webs. If we now shift focus to symbiosis, symbiosis is a relationship where two species will live in a closely knit relationship. Now, sometimes both benefit from this relationship, but not always. What we're going to talk about are the three types of symbiosis. Mutualism, where both individuals tend to benefit. Commensalism, where one benefits and the other really receives nothing from the relationship. And then parasitism, where one benefits and the other is harmed. So let's go through mutualism first. So if we start with mutualism, this is the relationship where both species involved benefit from one from living in a close relationship with one another. Classic example would be that of the clownfish and the anemone. The clownfish will live and hide amongst the tentacles of the anemone. So the clownfish gains a home. The anemone will be cleaned by the clownfish. The anemone will feed off of waste from the clownfish. And the clownfish will actually scare away predators that might attack the anemone. And so they both benefit. 
Another kind of fun example is that of cleaner organisms. You know, the red-billed oxpecker is just one example of a cleaner animal. And what this animal does, the, the oxpecker, is that it will eat parasites off of the bodies of the second organism involved. In this picture, it tends to be a buffalo. So the buffalo benefits by being free of parasites and the bird receives a meal. There's all kinds of examples of cleaner organisms. There are fish, small fish that will clean the mouths of bigger fish, birds that will clean the mouth of crocodiles, shrimp that will clean off and eat parasites off of, for instance, crabs and, and other uh, ocean, uh, ocean life. Another classic example is the relationship between hummingbirds, which will feed on the nectar, and uh, flowers, which will receive pollination. They both benefit. The hummingbird receives food and the flower is able to reproduce because the hummingbird will transfer pollen from flower to flower to flower as it flies around. Let's shift focus to commensalism. In this relationship, one member will benefit and the other is neither helped nor harmed. You know, a good example is this picture right here. Notice the small white birds in the picture. These are called egrets and they will live in a close relationship with, for instance, horses and cattle, pigs. As the horses and the cattles and the pigs, you know, roam around, they stomp around, they, they stir up insects, which are then fed upon by the egret. So the egret benefits by getting food and there doesn't really seem to be any benefit to uh, the horses or the cattle that are stomping around stirring up the insects. Another good example of commensalism is for instance in barnacles. Now here's a picture of a whale coming to the surface. You see its blowhole there at the top of the picture. And in this picture, you can see there are barnacles that have attached themselves to the outside of the whale. And the barnacles benefit, number one, they have a home free from predators because not really much hunts uh, these whales. And also the barnacles have better access to food because the whales are swimming through the water, which you know is how barnacles get their food. Barnacles will just filter food out of the water. And as the whales swim through their, the water of the ocean, uh, the barnacles will filter and feed out organisms for them to, to live off of. So a great example where the barnacle benefits, and as far as we can tell, there doesn't seem to be any harm done to the whales. And another example of commensalism is epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that live on top of other plants. You know, here's a picture of an epiphyte, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of feet off the ground living amongst the treetops of another species of plant. This epiphyte benefits because it has better access to sunlight. And there, you know, it's not a parasitic relationship. There's no harm being done to the tree that it's living on top of. And so the last example is parasitism. This is where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. And probably the classic example of parasitism is that of a tapeworm. And so Humans can be infected by, uh, with a tapeworm by eating uh, infected or undercooked meat. And then the tapeworm larva will begin to grow inside of our intestines. And the tapeworm, when we look at the head of a tapeworm, it's got these hooks on it and these hooks will hook onto our intestines. And, and so they feed on food that passes through our intestines. And ultimately, if we look in the pinkish area of this, of this chart here, these are some of the side effects that tend to come from, you know, having, for instance, parasites living in us. For instance, ones, uh, for instance, the parasite of a, of a tapeworm. These are some of the side effects that we that we tend to see in humans. Let's not forget, tapeworms are not the only examples of parasites. You know, fleas and ticks will feed off of the blood of our pets, and of course, not just our pets, but for you pet owners out there. Again, you know, flea and tick season, make sure you guys, you know, are, are checking your dog and, and taking care of man's best friend. So as I wrap up this video, I want to leave you with not just a practice quiz, but also kind of what I consider to be a funny example of commensalism. So if you read over this example and actually look on YouTube for videos of this, it's 
pretty hilarious, I think. So go ahead and, you know, try this practice quiz. And if you're in my class, I'm happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. Thanks for watching.